So thanks to everybody for coming back out. I know that obviously we've, we're getting towards the end of the program. You already have a lot to think about, so we appreciate you kind of opening your brains one more time for us. Um, I am going to be doing a little kind of presentation to set the stage, but before I do that, I'm going to introduce our two panelists. So immediately to my left, we have Saskia Clifford Mobley, who is currently the manager of the gallery partnerships for Artsy for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. She was previously a business-to-business uh, -business, um, brand solutions manager, was that the correct title? At yeah. Google. So she comes from kind of a stricter tech background. And then to Saskia's left is Sophie Neuendorf from Artnet. She is the director of Artnet's gallery network. And Sophie comes from a more specific art background. Previously, before Artnet, she was at Christie's and some other places in the, the art world. So We've kind of got it, we're hitting it from both sides here, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some interesting perspectives on things. So with that out of the way, um, let's talk about the online art market. So when we talk about the online art market, I think it's, it's important to think about the, how we're framing it, what it is specifically that we're talking about. Um, a little bit about me, I have not been a journalist for... Um, for that many years, I got my start in the gallery business. I was working at a, our favorite term, uh, mid-level gallery for about eight years, give or take. Um, so I've seen this from kind of both sides of the looking glass, and hopefully that'll give me some, some interesting perspective on things. Um, with that said, one of the things that I think about a lot is when we in the art industry start talking about issues, especially like tech, we have a tendency, I think, sometimes to get a little nearsighted about it and lose the, the kind of broader picture of what's happening. So what I'd like to do to kind of set the stage initially is just to talk a little bit about not the online art market, but the online market in retail more broadly. So if we go back to 2011 and you look at the world population generally, at that point, 11% of people per capita had made at least one e-commerce purchase that year. 9.6% of people owned a smartphone, and overall you had about $650 billion in online retail sales. Fast forward five years, and now those percentages have changed like this. Now you have 22% of people who have made at least one e-commerce purchase. So that number doubled. Then you had 28% of people who owned a smartphone, so that number tripled. And you had about $1.9 trillion in online retail sales, so that number also about tripled. If you wanted to tell this story with pictures, instead of with boring statistics, you could look at our friend Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, this is him in his original office in Seattle in 1999. If I didn't know any better, I would tell you that this guy was probably like a sad middle manager at an office supply store. <laughs> Fast forward 18 years, and last year, this is what Jeff Bezos looked like. This is the power of e-commerce in action. He is literally flexing on all of us. So, naturally, that begs the question, what about the online art market? It turns out, it depends on who you ask. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal ran a big profile on David Zwerner. And in the context of that article, he mentioned that now 30% of his clients buy work solely on the basis of emailed images. That's a huge number. As a matter of fact, it's so big that it basically makes David Zwerner the Jeff Bezos of the art online art market. But I think it's safe to say that that's atypical. Now, if you ask about the kind of broader spectrum of online art sales, you'll get a few sets of numbers. In general, the two most popular sets that you'll get will come from the Art Basel and UBS report and the Hiscox online art trade report, which is done in conjunction with Art Tactic. Um, between those two, they will tell you that there were somewhere between 3.8 and $4.9 billion in online art sales in the year 2016. Uh, the market share was between 8.4 and 9%. And from that number, you would basically be on par with what was happening in the general retail sector. I would really like to believe these numbers. But if you're a hopeless nerd like I am, what happens anytime you get one of these art market reports is that you cycle all the way to the back and you look at the methodology, which basically says, how did we get to these numbers? Now, as a I'm going to focus on the Hiscox report because it's just about the online art market, and I think that that's interesting for us. 
Um, again, a recap of their findings. $3.75 billion in online art sales, 8.4% market share, 15% year-on-year growth from the year before. Where are they getting these numbers from? This takes us into a question that's their first to sample size. Sample size is a really basic statistical concept. It basically means if you're trying to project about a big population, you have to interview like a small population. So how many people are you going to interview? That's your sample size. To get to this $3.75 billion number, they interviewed representatives from 42 of the 75 online art platforms that they tracked. That's fine. I don't have any issue with that. They talked to 132 galleries out of, if you talk to Claire McAndrew, she will say that there were 296,000 small art sellers across the world last year. And then they talked to 758 buyers. And the question of how many art buyers are in the, in, in, in the world at any given time is a really hard question to answer. The best that you can really do is look at who's most likely to be an art, art buyer. And the answer to that is people who make over $100,000. There were 398 million people in the world who hit that category last year. This is my reaction <laughs> to those numbers. I can't say that they're wrong, and they may in fact be right, but the thing is, if you don't, if you're working with really small numbers, it increases the probability that you're really, you could be really off with your projections. This takes us to the second point. The second principle here is called sample structure or sample composition. What this means, basically, is again, if you're trying to look at a big population of people through a small population of people, you want the people in that small population to look as much like the people in the large population as you can possibly do. So this may, means things like age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, all those kinds of things. To visualize. Say that you are an edgy streetwear brand like this, and you want to put out a line of clothes that looks something like this, and you're trying to figure out ahead of time whether or not what you're doing is going to hit with your audience. If you wanted to run a statistical model on this, I would highly recommend to you that your sample structure not look like this. <laughs> because I don't care how many of those people you interview, you are not going to find out anything about the people who would wear those clothes. So that raises the question of the sample structure in the Hiscox report. Of those 132 galleries, here are some things that we don't know about them. We don't know how big they are. We don't know where they are. We don't know whether they focus on the primary market or the secondary market. We don't know what era they specialize in or what media they specialize in. We're not even sure if they're selling art because this report mixes the collectibles trade with the art trade. That means things like, specifically in this report, furniture, decorative arts, design, and while those are all totally honorable professions, I think that we in this room are not as concerned with them as we would be about actual contemporary art or art of any kind. So again, when we look at sample structure, and you ask me, Tim, how helpful is this? My reaction is kind of this. <laughs> now, to be fair, I, I'm doing this not because I want to go on a diatribe about like statistics in the art market. The reason I think it's important to look at where these numbers are coming from is that when you hear numbers like $3.75 billion in online art sales, and this is, again, coming from somebody who's worked in the gallery sector, I think that it raises the probability that you end up having one of two reactions. One is, oh my God, this thing is already getting so big. I don't have any idea how I'm going to catch up. Maybe I should, just shouldn't even try. I'll just wait for the next thing, or I'll do the absolute minimum needed to actually participate. The other reaction that I think is, is possible is that you can say, oh my God, $3.75 billion in online sales. I have no idea what I'm doing. Most everybody else that I talk to, they admit that they have no idea what they're doing. So I guess it just happens on its own. All that I have to do is open up a storefront on Artsy or Artnet and start a web page, and it takes care of itself. Those of you who have tried this know that this is not really how it works. So how do we end up in this scenario? To me, a big part of the problem comes back to this theme that we've had about transparency. In fairness to the people who are putting together these art market reports, who I have a great deal of respect for, and I honestly think that they're really trying to do the best they can, the problem with anything that comes to statistics is that you can only do what you can with the numbers that you're given. If you can't get good information about what it is that you're trying to quantify, the best that you can do is 
basically guesswork. So transparency is a big issue here. If talking to gallerists, talking to online art platforms, even talking to buyers, if those people aren't being upfront with you about what it is that they're doing, you basically have no hope of really having any kind of understanding for what's going on. And obviously the transparency thing plays even bigger than that because even though I'm going to take a look at some things that are really simple, like who makes pricing available and who actually tells you whether or not the works that you're seeing could actually be bought, the transparency issue is a much bigger question. It relates to things like even how galleries are going to work with their artists, like are each of them aware of what their expectations are for what each other is going to do? Are you working with your colleagues elsewhere in the gallery sector openly and having kind of a free and fair exchange? All those things are big questions, and the less of that that we have, the harder it is to understand what's going on, and the harder it is to come up with solutions for what is increasingly a really hard set of problems. So, just on the basics, Artsy did a survey last year that revealed some interesting information. What they found was that for galleries that included price and availability information up front on their website, they got better inquiries, they had a higher likelihood of sale, and they got better sales prices, which all seems encouraging and important. The question, though, as we know, is that the art sales space, in a lot of cases, ends up being a follow-the-leader business. And there's natural, it's natural to do that on some level. Like if you want to see what the really successful people are doing, you think that you might be able to model yourself after that. So that begs the question, what are the people that we've been talking about as the mega gallerists all weekend or all the last couple of days, what are they doing online? What you're looking at now is the results of a high level data mining operation that consisted of me hand counting artworks on my laptop inside of a Starbucks. This is the kind of quality you get at Talking Galleries 2018, folks. <laughs> so it's a really, really simple analysis, but I think it's, it's powerful. What you have here is, is just the five mega galleries and their presence on Artnet circa June 1st of last year, which is when I was finishing my book. So the results are pretty obvious. You have almost 600 works between them that were allegedly on offer. Nobody bothered to list any prices for it, and uh, there was no click-to-buy capability attached to that either. If you go to Artsy, very similar results. The chart is expanded for reasons that I, I won't bore you with, but the point is in those gray boxes. Now you have almost 1,200 works. 59 of them had prices listed, so that's 5%. And again, click to buy was, was not an option really at that point. Um, what does this tell you? I think it tells you that it's time to rethink what you're doing online to a certain extent. Uh, by the way, my, my browser history is really interesting these past few days. <laughs> but if we go back to this and we kind of think about what's happening here, I think it tells you a couple of things. One is there's nothing inherently more transparent about being online than being offline. If you want to use your online presence to try to cultivate an air of exclusivity and try to kind of build up this mythology around you and your business, you can do that. There are galleries who are doing it. They are really successful galleries. That doesn't necessarily mean, again, if we go back and we look at these transparency issues, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the thing that you should be doing. So I think this takes us back to the, the kind of final point that I would like to make, is that, again, what do we talk about when we talk about the online art market? If we're just talking about, okay, things I'm going to put up on a website and hopefully sell, I think that that's too narrow a way of looking at it. What I would encourage everyone to do, and this is just my opinion, so take that for what it's worth. I'm a guy who comes up with graphics like this. So, But I think that it's more helpful to think about the online art market as a kind of collision of all these different things, like your social media presence, your digital marketing and digital advertising, um, the synergies that you can create between your online and your offline presence. For instance, uh, Maybe you're putting on events in your gallery space and you want to live stream a talk or something like that. Or you want to, uh, let's say, time your, you're going to present an art fair booth. And so you end up kind of changing around your website or your arts or your art net pages to kind of promote what you're doing at the fair. Like those things make sense and I think may make a difference. And then the last thing is just new technology. I mean, again, to kind of zoom out a little bit, when we here in this room are talking about like, online sales as a potentially revolutionary thing and it's 
2018, if you told that to people in any other retail sector, like they would laugh at you and be like, what are you talking? Like, we're so far beyond that right now. But it's a really hard thing. There are new, new technologies coming down the pike that nobody really fully knows what to do. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to do everything, but I think that it is smart, especially for people who are smaller, who can't compete on kind of a staff level or a money level with the really big players to really think about kind of what else is happening out there and how you might be able to change what you do based on these new tools that are becoming available. So that's a pretty good segue. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm gonna move over here now and talk to our panelists about this stuff. Thank you. What? Okay. Um, so now that everyone knows that I'm an insane person, um, <laughs> before we get into the, the actual discussion, I just want to put a few disclaimers up front. Um, number one, we talked amongst ourselves and we decided that we didn't want this to be like a war between Artsy's features and Artnet's features. Like we just didn't think that that was going to be particularly helpful. I think if you guys want like an in-depth sales pitch that uh, Saskia and Sophie are probably loaded up with business cards. You can talk to them after the session. <laughs> but we're going to try to keep this like really high level. The other thing is that well, we'll, we'll explore this in more depth, but like not everything we say is going to apply for everyone. It's, there, there are no one-size-fits-all solutions, I don't think. Um, so just keep that in mind. With all that said, Sophie. Yes. Tim. I think that what it would be helpful for people to hear about is just sort of from your experience, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you think that gallerists have about the way that the online space works? Um, well, since I started at Artnet, I think the most common, one of the most common things I've heard, or the two of them, would be um, that the idea that if they post one of their artworks from the inventory online on Artnet, that that would essentially burn the artwork. That was something weirdly popular and, and something that galleries seem to be afraid of. Um, and uh, some of them have come now, come around to the idea that that's not going to happen. Others are still sticking to that. So uh, that was one. And the other one, um, again, very popular, was that um, the transparency that we offer at Artnet and also that Artsy is offering uh, would in fact hinder their business and uh, not allow them to move freely in, in their pricing. And so um, this is something we're still struggling with a little bit within the gallery network um, is the idea that if you put prices online and are very transparent about that, that this is something that um, would not be great for their business. Mm -hmm. And just for context, Sophie, can you, how long have you been at Artnet now? Now it's been, oh goodness, <laughs> eight years. Okay. Eight so years at Artnet. Yeah, so that's, that's like a long time and mm -hmm. we're still kind of dealing with these same issues. Saskia, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, in terms of, I think, misconceptions, um, and this has been a real learning curve for me as I've transitioned from working for kind of a, a big tech company into this industry, is the idea that um, the audience on these online platforms, I think there can be this misconception that it's, oh, it's just the kids who are online. Uh, you know, my collectors aren't really you know, using these platforms or online, whether it's a platform like Artnet, Artsy, Instagram, and so forth. Um, but that's just not true. I mean, your audiences really are online, and their digital footprint is as varied as your very own, and so it's important to make sure you are where your audience is. Um, but yes, also the kids are online, but that's not a bad thing. The kids are all right, because they're the future collectors, and I think it's about cultivating that as well as your existing audience and really seeing the potential in the audience online. Um, and then the other misconception that I thought of is um, the idea that you can kind of dip your toe in the water and try digital. You know, I will do a three-month trial or... Um, maybe just buy some digital media advertising as a one-off and see how that goes. Um, and these short-term bursts really aren't a useful business strategy, and it's about thinking longer term, because if you just kind of scattergun, try lots of different things for short periods, you won't see the return on that investment, and you won't actually get the learnings or the data you need to really make sensible business decisions going forward. So I think it's not about doing a test or a trial um, 
digital presence, awareness, and sales take time to build up, and it's a very cumulative uh, approach to business building. Yeah, and I was I was actually talking to um, Ocean Ward, who is here somewhere, um, yesterday. There you are, Ocean. Um, and we were talking about this kind of idea of online presence as kind of like soft power almost, not so much that everything is going to immediately translate into results. Like just, just because suddenly you start an Instagram account, you're not going to be able to say, mm -hmm. oh, I've got 20 more people coming into my gallery every week. It's just not like that. It's just more kind of diffuse thing, which I think makes gallerists more likely to kind of ab abandon ship early. Um, but I'm editorializing a little bit. I should stop. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of a related issue, but... Um, Obviously, both of your jobs are sort of to, to help galleries get as much as they can out of your platforms. Again, everybody is different. So can you maybe talk a little bit about some of the differences in approach or, or even just experience level of technology that, that you guys find over time? I mean, Saskia, maybe you can start. In terms of the, the galleries and businesses that we're... Yeah, like what are, the, what are some of the different things mm -hmm. you find people looking for? So it's, it's a broad spectrum and... It's been, again, fascinating for me to work with an industry and set of clients and businesses um, where it, there's such varying degree of expertise and confidence and experience within these businesses. You have the David Zwerners who have incredible large-scale integrated campaigns and full kind of operational um, resource at their business to... to do that, make that effort, through to um, one man, one woman operations where you're kind of a Swiss army knife and trying to do absolutely every aspect of the business. And digital might not be your strong set. So I think it's it's a very broad spectrum in terms of the the galleries that we're working with. And it's there's no one size fits all. And I think it's really about working out what your key business objective is. Are you trying to build brand awareness? Are you trying to uh, increase footfall into your physical space and therefore raise awareness at a, a local regional level? Are you trying to perhaps grow internationally and generate an export business? Um, are you trying to amplify seasonal live events such as fairs? I mean, there are so many different objectives and I think it's about actually being quite strategic and strict with yourself and working out what it is you want to do and then putting your focus and, en and energy onto that aspect of, of your digital presence. Um, and relying on expertise in the industry and third parties such as Artness and Artsy who essentially can guide and advise on that. Yeah, and I guess, I would. how many people actually really have that stuff worked out before they, they come and talk to you? I mean, that's a question for either one of you. It varies. I, it's genuinely... You know, if I think about the gallery partnerships team um, in Europe at Artsy, they will have one conversation with someone who's very savvy, very confident, has experience in um, looking at their kind of digital footprint and data and making the, the correct decisions off the back of it, to somebody who genuinely doesn't feel comfortable in investing in a new set of computers for the business, let alone then kind of getting the digital skill set they need to make the right decisions. Um, so I, I really wouldn't be able to say, you know, X percent are confident. Yeah. It's the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it also develops into a conversation. They may come to us and say, we want such and such, and might, may go into a completely different direction after having a conversation mm -hmm. and seeing what the product offering is. And I think I agree with you that one does, or we try to be really quite sensitive, as, as you do as well, to where the gallery is from, what they're offering is, are they an emerging gallery? Mm -hmm. Do they want to advertise their new shows or their new or first uh, art for participation? Or are they so well known that you know, maybe they just want to use the price database and, uh, and take it from there? So yeah, I think it's just about tailoring it to that specific gallery and then taking it from there after a conversation. Has that changed much over the course of eight years? Like, do you, do you still kind of see as wide a spread as you used to? Or do you feel like people are coming into it now with more of a kind of baseline understanding of, of what they want or how to use the technology or any of that stuff? I can't say it has. I mean, we were talking about this morning, and um, as she just said, as Saskia just said, there are these galleries that are very, very savvy, especially the younger and emerging ones. And then there are those antique, de antique dealers who 
well, some of them actually decide to obviously go completely offline and not have a proprietary site and not be in any on art or artsy. Mm -hmm. So it com there's a broad spectrum, and I suppose one one has to be sensitive and to all of them. It's uh, well, yeah, it's it hasn't changed in that sense. People are still some people are still struggling to come to terms with online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say though, I think there has been the shift from the, you know, should I really start thinking about a digital presence to kind of how I should think about it and. Yes speaking with the team and I'm sure Sophie's experience can uh, illuminate this it's now there's there has been the pivot as to okay I understand this is critical now I need to think about what is the best strategy f for my business and my inventory mm -hmm. and and in terms of like implementation I mean we're all sort of saying that we we now think that your online presence is basically as important a part of your business as like accounting or shipping or whatever it's mm -hmm. like something that you need to do. But if you're especially a really small gallery, say you're, you're a mom and pop store essentially, like how do you end up implementing that? Because I mean, look, I can speak to it from my experience in the gallery world where we'll be aware like, oh, we should really update our artsy page or our art net page or whatever. But you get to it, it's 545, you've had a hell of a day. It's the easiest thing in the world to put off. Like you know that you can just do it tomorrow. Whereas everything else, you're just like, oh, I've got to follow up on shipping about this. I've got to follow up with this person about payment. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And those things all just seem so much more present on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're like, oh, okay, well, it's fine. I'll just do it this time tomorrow. And then you look up and two months have passed. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so what do, you, what, do you have any recommendations in terms of like how people can start to kind of wrap their minds around mm -hmm. like the idea that this needs to be something that they should really be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I feel so strongly about this. You wouldn't ask your intern to do your legal work. You wouldn't ask the gallery manager to do your full accounts. I mean, it, these are specialist skill sets, and digital is exactly the same. And you should really think about uh, hiring a, a specialist within this digital world. And if you can't increase your headcount at the business, then really invest in upskilling and training for existing staff so that you are future-proofing your business and you are in the right position to succeed. In terms of recommendations, so take it seriously um, is, is the big one. And think about in terms of um, input equals output, right? It, you know, Sophie mentioned a gallery might kind of upload one artwork and just assume that that's it, that's it. The, the profile's yeah. there. <laughs> no, it's a constant, continuous relationship you should have with your digital presence. And um, the more time you, you focus on it and dedicate time to it, the more results, the, the stronger results you will actually see. Um, at Arts, we know that the re when the response time for a gallery responding to an inquiry goes down in terms of it takes less time to respond, the um, conversion rate goes up. You know, the more hands-on you are, the more success you will see. Um, so that would definitely be a recommendation. Just take it seriously. Um, and then another recommendation I'd recommend is just understand the understand the positive power of data. So it's not scary. It's empowering, and there are so many ways you can really look at data um, and. You know, you don't need a PhD in statistics to make sense of it. It's actually very straightforward. Um, you look at data, for example, collector on your collector profiles, um, and then you can make more informed decisions about how to tailor your offering to them. Um, you know, every inquiry essentially is the opportunity to foster a new relationship with a collector, and so you should be looking at their profile to get understand what they want more. Um, also see data as empowering in terms of, again, the, the input equals output. The more you upload, the more data you attach. So pricing is obviously a huge piece, but uh, the more high resolution images you can attach, not just some installation shots, but specifically of the artwork. You know, we have some galleries who are incredible at servicing their collectors through Artsy, and they will, uh, Photoshop mock-ups of the artwork in that person's house so they can understand the scale, for example. Um, all of that is good stuff, but also artist-level data. Um, particularly if you're representing um, emerging artists, 
all of that metadata that you provide on an artwork makes it more surfaceable, more discoverable, and not just on platforms, but in Google search and SEO, it's all logged in the internet. And so I would say, really understand the power of data and take it seriously. Yeah, and just for, for the uninitiated, SEO stands for search engine optimization. <laughs> it's the idea of basically how you can put your presence out there online in a way that makes you the most findable for whatever it is that, that you're trying to put out there. For instance, if you represent an artist and other galleries also represent that artist, um, search engine optimization is one of the ways you can try to make sure that you're the first gallery that somebody sees when they search for that artist. So yeah. that's just a sidebar. It's, it's about, sorry to interject. Yeah, please, it's about <laughs> please, by all means. Making it as easy as possible for the collector, right? Whether that is you are the first answer to their Google search and, and your, your artist works appear there, or by displaying a price. It's making fewer steps, fewer hurdles or hoops for the collector to jump through and therefore they're more likely to take an action. And the easier you make it, the more, the, the greater the success you will have. As we were talking about this morning, the more information you provide uh, readily and the lower the steps are for the collector to access you, yeah, the better. And relationships, I think, online as well as offline. If you have a friendship and you don't invest into it, then that's not going to grow in any way. And the same is, you know, you have to treat your online presence on Artnet and Artsy the same way and uh, really invest in that, as you said. I think we see the same thing at Artnet. The more artworks you put online, the more often you rotate your inventory and the more information you give us and the more searchable it is on Artnet and the more that allows us to do our job and help you and thus help your business. And do you think that people who you work with in the gallery network, do you think that they're coming around to that idea more and more? Or is it still something that you feel like you have to kind of handhold them through and like really try to get them to believe in this idea that maybe more information is a good thing? Um, I think there's still quite a lot of handholding and convincing to do. We do advertise the fact that the more, as Artsy does, if you provide prices readily, then that will make increase transparency and make collectors more comfortable. Um, however, we have only a handful of galleries that do that readily, perhaps maybe 180. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really not something they do, they do readily. And um, yes, we do have to push our galleries and remind them, and we do mm -hmm. it happily, to add to their inventory and add their exhibition and add their museum or sh you know, participation or their art fair participation. Um, sometimes it's just, gener just genuinely forgetting, and other times, yes, it's because they think, oh my goodness, it's 5.30, right. and I've got some other things to do. Right. Mm. Yeah. But then, of course, that's why client services come in, comes in, and you can actually just allow us to, mm. to do our jobs and do it for you, but it's something that you have to be happy to do it. Do it yourself or let Artnet or Artsy do it for you, but mm. it's a conversation, I guess. Yeah, I, I would say the the consultancy that we're able to offer galleries in terms of, okay, what is your objective? What's, okay, what is the strategy we're going to put in place for you? And kind of building out that plan, whether it's an upload schedule or if you choose to, for example, do exhibition previews online only, um, really plotting that out in advance and working closely with the platform to make sure that you're making the right decisions with that. Um, and just keeping that close working relationship. So, for example, one of our galleries in their first year, they made uh, two sales through Artsy and they completely changed their strategy. They started displaying prices and massively reduced their um, inquiry response rate to every inquiry they receive. They now answer within 24 hours is the kind of company line. This is what we do as a business now. And then they sold over 50 the following year just by making these changes and putting that focus. So I think the, the support that we can offer our gallery partners and the, the optimizations and recommendations, I think, are significant. And we are available to do that. Right. Well, this, I guess, Sophie, before we were talking about the idea that, that maybe the, the attitudes haven't necessarily changed that much in eight years about this, can you... Maybe talk about something where you have seen a, a pretty substantial kind of shift in people's behavior or thinking over that time? In eight years, um, gosh. Yes, eight years to me seems like a long time, but in fact, I think in, in technology, there's been so much advancement. I think eight years ago when I started, maybe five galleries had uh, a presence on Facebook, a professional one, and now you cannot, most galleries do, they just, uh, it's just shifted. I mean, now then there was Instagram and WeChat, 
that developed and now you can actually shop on Instagram and uh, artists are selling via their studios on WeChat. So I think the whole social media development and the shopping that goes along with it and being able to purchase artworks online, even if many collectors maybe aren't comfortable buying it, uh, the option to do that, I think, in eight years, that's a big leap. Mm -hmm. I think this is the biggest change, um, how social media has really developed into to a viable business option for, for galleries. Um, I think that in eight years, that's, that's the biggest change for me. Yeah, Saskia, can you talk to it from, I mean, obviously you, you went through kind of a big change in going from a like dedicated tech giant where this stuff works very differently. Like, mm -hmm. was there almost like a culture shock when you got into art scene? <laughs> you were like, wait, what do you guys do? Why are you not doing this, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, not from the perspective of moving to Artsy. Not from Artsy the platform's perspective. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just in terms of, <laughs> Tech yeah. Technology like, right. company that's very kind of product and design-led. Tech world to art world. world. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of the broader industry, I mean, I went from working with uh, large advertisers and media agencies who were trying to do really experimental, sometimes ill-advised things with technology and really um, being extremely forward-looking to an industry that is still hesitant and still um, learning what the right model is for, for the business. It's, it's difficult. It's in the way that if I think back to in my previous role, kind of there were more broad stroke recommendations I could make. You know, you know your type of business. So if you are a packaged consumer goods retail business, great, we would advise this. If you are a telco company, great, this is kind of the best approach you should take. But with galleries, as I mentioned earlier, the, the spectrum is so large. Um, There's no one size fits all. No, strategy. not at all. Yeah. And so, um, that's been a fun journey for me in terms of getting to grips with that and uh, I think really listening as much as possible to our gallery partners and last night was fantastic meeting so many people and just hearing about their experiences because that's then just triggering new ideas of okay well this is maybe a strategy we can implement with this type of gallery for example. I was just speaking to one of the galleries that is here the other night as well, which was very interesting to hear that they have different approaches on social media, what they use WeChat for, what mm. they use Instagram for, the types of images that they would put online. And I think that's probably something you've been hearing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know um, in the Artsy Gallery Roundup survey that Tim mentioned in his um, very good presentation, oh. <laughs> um, uh, another uh, statistic that, that came out of that um, was that just over half of um, the galleries we interviewed, who were a combination of artsy partners and, and non-partners, um, had experimented with online video in the last year, which I think is a really interesting shift. So I think, and we would expect that to increase. So I think definitely uh, the art industry is trying new things for sure, but I do feel like we, as a broader group, are several years behind many other businesses. So for example, again, uh, at breakfast we're discussing uh, kind of the retail sector and Amazon have just launched this new shop where uh, they're essentially eliminating checkout tills and it's all done with sensors and lasers and they're completely changing that retail experience. If you think that some business models are changing in such a radical way, they're changing the way humans are behaving, uh, we have a way to go till we get to that level. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical that we'll ever get there, <laughs> or, or that we should. That's the extreme by example. The way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I'm a big believer in the idea that so much of what makes the art industry unique <coughs> and kind of makes it work is this whole social aspect that's built mm -hmm. around it, and like the idea. And I talk about this. Yeah, like I talk about this a lot in my book, but like the whole idea that somebody would just say, "Oh, well, here, I'll create an experience where." You, you collector can just now, instead of having to go to art fairs or go to shows or whatever and talk to people, like you can just go online and click to buy and collector's gonna be like, I don't Add wanna do that. Mm -hmm. Like that sounds horrible. I mean, th there's some collectors, maybe not so much, but broadly speaking, I feel like people actually wanna be involved. They wanna see the art, they wanna see other people, all those kinds of things. So yeah, like I, I, don't, I don't envision a gallery where we have the Jeff Bezos like scanner only system no. happening, but who knows? I, I could be totally off base about that. And I think it's really important for galleries to view the online relationships and kind of client cultivation that can happen there in the same way they would regard kind of a walk into the physical space and really 
give the same amount of attention and it's about the expertise that you have and the the way you can then bring the expertise to the potential buyer and I don't see why online should remove that that human personal element in any way it should be the kind of common thread that goes through all operations I'm just thinking this now but when you're talking to any of your gallery partners and they tell you what they want to do, like, do you ever just tell them that they're wrong? Are you ever just like, no, that's not the way that you should do this? Or are you just like really trying to kind of respect their wishes? It varies. Um, I would say I've definitely seen a couple of instances where um, they haven't want to, uh, a gallery hasn't wanted to include any um, information on the artwork and it's kind of all very low key. And for me, that is just frustrating because that defeats the point of the the engine we have that runs the platform, which surfaces the right artwork to the to the right collector based on their behaviours. Um, and so you're effectively doing yourself a disservice if you don't take advantage of the technology which is available. So certainly we would say kind of no, you need to include at least some more information, otherwise the work isn't discoverable and your artists won't be surfaced to the right people. Um, we've seen that. And then also, I think, again, kind of a point I mentioned right at the beginning in terms of what, what is your objective? Do you, are you trying to raise awareness? Do you want to use a platform like Artnet or Artsy as a marketing comms tool? Or are you looking to drive sales? And if you're looking to drive sales, what's that strategy? Is that local? Is that international? Is it seasonal? And just, I think, approach a partnership sensibly so you know exactly what you want to get out of it and then we know what the inputs should be. And the idea of convincing those partners that uh, we're working in their best interest and the more transparent they are with us, the better it is for their business, mm. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. The, the beauty of working for a tech company, like the absolute joy of working for a company like Artsy is we have data, sa we're sat on that data that we can then share with people and say, you know, the numbers don't lie x equals y, if you do this, you should see the increase in quality of inquiries or sales. And so to be able to actually share hard numbers and trends with galleries in their best interests is wonderful. It's not kind of, you know, just plucking an idea out of thin air. It's really rooted in actual data and people's behavior. So before, we had, you had talked a little bit about sort of social media being a big change in the art market from the time that you started at Artnet to today. Can you expand on maybe like how it's different, like wh what you think it's affected most in kind of either specifically with the way that you run the Artnet gallery network or just kind of more broadly in the, the art industry overall? Do you mean in terms of sales? I, or no, not necessarily. Engagement? Just Yeah, I mean just maybe just the way that people are thinking about it or maybe asking questions that they didn't ask before or whatever. I mean, I, I'm just, I have no idea. This is why I'm asking the question. I think really it's because it's the one shift that I've seen is that um, from starting as something that they found um, superfluous and, and also superficial and not maybe not serious enough for, for the art world, it's become really an uh, indispensable tool for advertisement and sales. And I think that is the, the biggest shift I've seen. Um, but then also having to now go all the way to being sensitive about what types of platforms these are mm -hmm. and also becoming part of our product offering um, towards galleries. Um, when they're on Artsy or Artnet, you, we do offer um, this type of, of exposure by being a partner and being on our social media or, or uh, advertising their programs on their social mm -hmm. media and this exchange and conversation and engagement. I think this is something that's really become important for, for our business uh, overall and our product offering. That's, I think, the shift. What about you? Yeah, I think when it comes to social media, it's just no one channel exists in isolation. So you can't just say, I'll have an Instagram account. Great. That's social, you know, box ticked. You know, again, your audience and your collectors are across many different channels. And so it's your responsibility to greet them at each of those, those points. And so I think it's just being very sensible about, okay, of the, the different channels which we are going to operate, what is our approach to them, and um, how are they integrated? Because there needs to be consistency within that. You can't have a different voice across these different platforms. And so I would say, 
happen and, and again you nurture it over time and, and the, the rewards are cumulative. So my recommendation from the social perspective and I'm sure the, the guys who are going to be speaking on the next panel will go into this in much more detail is have a, an integrated strategy um, that also links your, your online and your social with your real world events as well and make sure they're not in silos. Your, your online and your offline should be working s completely together at all times for maximum impact. Um, that would be my recommendation. Well, I think that that's a, uh, that's a good time for us to kind of open it out to the audience and start taking questions. Um, before I do that, just out of respect for everyone else here, if you are going to ask a question, I would highly encourage you to make your first sentence a question and to not have a second sentence. <laughs> Tough. Let's just give it a shot, see how it works. If it's bad, it's bad. One we'll, line. We'll go back. But don't be scared just because he said that. Yeah, now I'm afraid <laughs> I shut down the whole thing. Anybody. Way in the back. There we go. I, I don't think the mic's on. Yeah. yeah. From Artsy and Artnet, from people who log in, the buyers and viewers and visitors to Artsy or Artnet, what are they looking for? I mean, in terms of price or what is it? Yeah. I mean, how long is a piece of string? Everybody is looking for something different. Um, it's a, I think it's a case of um, understanding that the technology is going to essentially help people navigate what it is they're looking for. And quite often, people will browse not knowing exactly what it is, but based on previous browsing behavior, we can actually start to create a, a picture for them of what it is they're looking for. In terms of price brackets, um, so typically, it's the sub $100,000 market. Um, That's quite big. <laughs> but no, absolutely, and there are there are brackets within that um, completely. I mean, uh, I would say it's the, the audiences are operating at different levels. There's definitely a chunk of our audience who are looking around the three thousand dollar mark, and then there's a, a large chunk of our audience who typically will be kind of fifty k and above, and the audiences are behaving and interacting with those price brackets in different ways. Um, it would be. Yeah, it's difficult to say, you know, they, you know, people who are interested in this era at this size will be willing to put, spend X amount. Certainly, we're, we're building that data up and um, collector profiles, for example, are a tool that gallery partners can use to get a better sense of what people are looking for. And then once you've established that relationship with the collector, you can start to then surface more of that more in a more targeted way. Um, but from the the kind of pure behavioural standpoint. We have a wonderful, diverse audience. I think for us it depends on which product they're surfing. So if they're going on Artnet auctions, mm. then they might be looking for something at a different price bracket than, say, they would be looking for in the price database when they're simply researching. So I think it really varies from product to product. And you know our product offering is quite holistic. So uh, yeah, that does make a big difference. Uh, well, let's, Jean-Claude, how about you? Sorry, I'm like the annoying participant. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask, in the very beginning of your presentation, you meant, you quoted David Zwerner. I, I should, that's, that's not a quote from David Zwerner. It's a quote from the article. The, the writer mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. put that out there. Okay. In any case, he's, how I understood it is that um, so and so many percentages of his sales go via email, Mm -hmm. Right. How do you? Why do you calculate that into online purchases? Because that's I, a very different. Right. So I think that this, and uh, uh, and I'm I'll just, just wondering if you guys want to understood in. to be part of the yeah, online yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that this. I think that this. That's a great question. 
And it, it speaks to something that I, I maybe could have developed more towards the end there, but I think that this is part of the question of like how we think about what qualifies as an online sale and like what the value of being online is. Like again, from my perspective of working in a gallery, it's not as simple necessarily as like, oh, we got an inquiry from a collector that we hadn't met before. It came in through one of these platforms. We had a conversation with them completely online and a sale resulted in that it, and that's it. And instead it was this sort of mixture of things like somebody would contact us through one of these platforms, whether it was our own website or, or Artsy or Artnet or whatever, and we would get into a conversation with them about a, an art fair that we were gonna be at two weeks later, and then the collector shows up there. Then you start to have an, an offline relationship with them and that develops, and maybe they don't even buy anything at that point, but six months down the road, you make a sale to them. You would still consider that an online? I, I think that it's... Purchase or...? I think that, for me at least, it's, it's less a question of like, does that count as offline or does it count as online and more? It's all the same. I think it's all an integrated ecosystem now. So if you're just trying to like silo what counts as, as online, it's maybe not the, the most helpful way of thinking about it. Because I th I, I'm, I'm always trying to encourage people to like get outside of this idea of the online space being something separate from what you do every day as a gallery. And like seeing those kinds of interactions happen convinces me that the more that you can sort of just unite them and, and think of it all as just one thing. They're just, it's the same, but you're running the same business. It's just a different communication tool. Um, that's, that's really what I've seen that works, but I mean, that's just personal experience more than anything. Thanks. In the back. Yes, Adam. I guess this is for Saskia. Um, is there something that you can do on your platform to help us when we engage with a collector through your platform, we spend a lot of time with them because we want to have a good reputation, engage them, and then they disappear? <laughs> I, it's a serious question because yeah. we try to be polite, we try to answer all our inquiries, mm -hmm. we try to take everybody seriously because you don't know who they are. And they spend a lot of time either checking prices or comparing with some auction result. And that's time I'd rather be spending on somebody serious or an artist. Mm -hmm. And I'd like a little defense you know, for, for what I'm doing, if it's possible. <laughs> Thanks. So other than me personally running after that person, um, no, there's a few things that definitely the platform can do to support that. And you raise such a great point in terms of your input and essentially expecting the output, which I'm harping on about. Um, in terms of the, the relationship between the collector and the gallery, that's absolutely, uh, on Artsy side is owned by the gallery, so we're not involved in that transaction or um, that, that relationship. So it's, I guess I, w I would have two recommendations. The first is, um, we, we have different levels of partner subscriptions, but on our premium one, you're able to then access your um, collector's details after there has been um, back and forth with, with them. And so you're able to then approach them kind of off the platform and email them or call them and kind of manage that relationship. Um, and I guess I would ask, what would you do if with a walk-in who behaved like that? So you have the initial conversation, you're still investing time, thought, expertise, preparing a proposal for them to try and reach that point of sale, how would you approach it in real life? And how can we then, I guess this is almost an ask for you, how would you then say that could best translate into the online world? Well, I think part of it is that people take their time and effort to come down to the gallery. Mm. It shows that they're willing to they're willing to invest in a relationship as opposed to just sending a quick link or something mm. like that. Um, so your point is well taken, but I think it's the amount of time that we invest that we want to feel at least like somebody's got our back. Yeah. So things which we know improve um, inquiry quality, so that the p person is more likely to then continue that conversation with you down the line and hopefully result in a sale. Um, are things like 
as much information as possible on the artwork and as much artist context. You know, if you upload the artist's CV, for example, they will be able to get a sense of whether this is perhaps a good investment for them. Um, we're currently actually doing an A-B test with a new product launch where we're including artist level um, context data at, at the which will appear when you click on an artwork. So the collector will be able to see, you know, has this artist ever had a show in a museum? Uh, what type of galleries are representing them? And so all of that is there to empower the, the user, the collector, to think, okay, this is something I'm more serious about moving forward with. So all of that context that empowers the collector will mean that the ones which then filter down and inquire with you are probably more likely to then convert. Um, and I would recommend things like, obviously, pricing. We know that that really improves inquiry quality. Also, kind of any sort of metadata you can attach, um, and further information just just sh will improve that quality for you. Um, so I realise that when you are investing all of that time and thought, it is frustrating when a collector then chooses to stop engaging but you're more likely to have those valuable conversations. And also, once you have built that relationship with the collector, then that is something you can manage off the platform if need be and cultivate over time. Oh. Hold on. Okay. Why don't we go there first? And then we'll come back to you, I promise. Thanks. Um, I just wonder what the answer is to the question of W why won't my work get burnt if I put it up on a public forum and everyone knows it's for sale and maybe everyone knows it's been for sale for a year or two? Um, what is your answer to that question? Sorry, where? Oh, here. Oh, <laughs> over there. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm still trying to figure out why there is this sensitivity there. But And it's an excellent question, but I think maybe it's the idea that you have it up there for a certain amount of time and maybe nothing happens and such as some galleries, for example, they bring an artwork to, to an art fair, and if it doesn't get sold there, then maybe they shouldn't bring it to the next one, mm. not the next one. I think um, that is maybe the similar sense that if you have it up there for sale for a certain <coughs> amount of time, then and nothing happens and nothing moves, then it kind of limits the, limits the excitement about the artwork and uh, everything else you can then do with it. Um, I think that would be my most likely answer mm. and the, the response I, I I've gotten most recently. Say, what, I wondered what you say back to convince what I would people say that back. that isn't the case. <laughs> I would say that, um, oh goodness, I don't believe it would be. Um, I think that it's always good to be very open and transparent with the inventory you have. Fair enough if you don't want to list the prices, if that's something you would like to be more discreet about, but I don't think that having an artwork online is um, <coughs> necessarily going to make it any less valuable than whether than hiding it in, in, your, mm. in your back office. Um, just to build on that, I think it's an excellent question and certainly an objection that I think galleries do pose to platforms like ours regularly. My personal argument would be, um, if you don't put it up, then you will never reach this potential audience. Um, and, if, and also you have utter control over how long it's published for. It's not like you publish it online and then it's just there indelible on the, in the ether and you can never take it down. You have utter control over that. So you could publish for a couple of months and then take it down and then republish and uh, link different tags and categories to it. So it'd be surfaced to a new audience even. So you could even be very targeted and clever about surfacing it to different audiences at different times. Um, and so I would recommend taking advantage of that toolkit. Um, and also the argument of you either have zero share of voice representing that artist, or you have a share of voice. And if you don't publish anything, then you won't have that share of voice. And I, I would just add really quickly to Melanie's that I, I, and I don't know the answer to this, but from when I was working in the gallery sector, I, I really wonder if people who are <laughs> primarily getting introduced to artworks or to galleries online are necessarily even thinking about it in those same terms as like that artwork in particular as the exact one that I am going to be able to buy. Like speaking from experience, I can tell you that I, I have worked for places where 
we, the work wasn't available, but we left it up because we thought it was a great example of that artist's work that read really well online. And it would draw inquiries. And then when people ask, you'd be like, well, unfortunately, that one's not available. But here, we have this other mm -hmm. work that's from the same artist that you might, you might be interested in. Um, I mean, we can debate whether or not that's the right way to do things. Um, but I do know that it happens. And I, I, I think that it, it sort of raises this question of, again, like, should we automatically assume that people are interacting with art online in exactly the same way as they do offline and I, I would not say that they always do mm -hmm. and I don't know where the percentage breakdown is between like the things where it is like a mirror image and the things where it's not but something to think about I guess um, anybody else hi oh Lisa hey hello um, I just wanted to say first of all I'm a huge fan of art online I feel like there's um, some really interesting new platforms I love artsy I use it all the time um, I, l I am least interested, though, in that gallery interface part of it. And I think one of the things I am concerned about um, as someone caring very much about content and filtering mm -hmm. is that there's no editing on what goes into Artsy. So anybody can put their stuff up. And so when I am looking at Robert Ryman and then you know a collector I'm working with says, OK, well, I might also like this. I mean, it's just like a white painting. So I just worry about that side of it. It's like there's a place kind of with Instagram too, which, which I think is an interesting tool as well to use. And I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that as well. And I just wonder what, what you think about that. Sure. Shall I go first? <laughs> go for it. Um, so I think when we have that angle of, oh, but maybe um, the, there's a saturation of, of uh, works for that example that you gave. I would just kind of really return back to understanding the technology and that powers the platform. So we have this really gorgeous algorithm uh, that powers it and the Art Genome Project, which essentially means that we're only surfacing artworks which are really relevant to that user to them. And so it's not a case of somebody, I mean, sometimes people online, we've all done it, fall down the rabbit hole and just spend hours going down different categories and threads and seeing how they all connect together. But typically somebody will be going there knowing um, what they're interested in and it will be developing, again, like on Instagram, based on your previous behavior, it kind of becomes a more tailored experience. And so just have confidence in that. Oh, could she get the mic? Mm -hmm. Part of the art world, but what you're describing to me is more like trending. So if I'm, if I'm looking at this one day, then tomorrow I can look at something over here. And I don't, this is, this is just something I'm, I'm concerned about in terms of, real history, because I don't feel like it functions that way. Um, and what does that mean for future generations? And if this is the main platform that people are looking at to get their information, you know, are we all then just going to buy like plaid, because that's what's happening this month? So no, hopefully not. <laughs> um, so in terms of the recommendation, it, it's more bespoke to that individual and their behavior. So it's less about real time trends, although I would say that's definitely something we're looking at in terms of what data do we have that we can share with collectors and galleries on Are there trending. any curators or like, I mean, it just, this is where AI gets really terrifying, mm -hmm. right? Because this is like defining the future of, yeah. uh, of, of the art world and the art market. So, so definitely our art genome project um, is powered by curators who are building out the, the, the context of every kind of thread that we have in that project. Robot curators or real ones? Real human people. <laughs> and I can vouch for them as being wonderful. Um, I don't believe you. Have no, you drawn blood true. from them? Are you sure? Yeah. It's true. My gosh, we're going to have to do um, an expose of kind of the people contributing to the Art Genome Project, although I'm sure it's, it's on the website. Um, yeah, so there, there is an element of that, but it's also... But really if I want to pay, as a, I'm a gallery, I'm going to... I have no credentials, but I want to put all my artwork up on there. Then no curator is going to filter me out. 
in terms of who I mean, I find uh, that's the problem is because it's not curated, it's decided on by who's going to pay you on what gets in there. And then once I go in there, you're obligated, because I'm paying for it, to kind of put me in the mix. So just to check that I understand your point, it's your concern is you would upload some inventory. And there would be a lot of like really bad stuff mixed in with my good stuff. Oh, I see. There's no quality control. So we actually have quite strict eligibility criteria at Artsy in terms of the galleries that we work with. And it's based on a whole range of things such as artists represented, how engaging the program is, um, and how active the program is. And so we definitely work with galleries that we know the partnership would be beneficial for both parties in that their inventory would do well on the platform and also they are bringing quality inventory onto the platform that would satisfy our user base. Um, so I would say that there is an element of, uh, I guess, quality control in that sense. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, well, I have a question for actually both sides <laughs> of, of the stage. Uh, my name is Andre. Uh, I don't know if here is any uh, digital art galleries or dealers, but um, well, at least half of the of the digital artists who work with installations, so they have certain equipment, and some of the other digital artists they do cryptocurrency mining now, mm -hmm. and both cryptocurrency mining and digital artists they strictly open source. So they absolutely transparent by nature. Uh, and cryptocurrency market grows 10 times last year from 5 billion to, fi to, to from, from 50 to 500 billion. And next it will grow probably to 5 trillion and then 50 trillion. Then probably it will collapse. We don't know. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't seen dot com boom and how they was buying art, but it's definitely a proxy. And imagine a proxy of uh, 50 trillion for the art, so my question is, uh, and it's Web 3.0, yeah? So my question is, how are you getting prepared for Web 3.0? Because definitely now we're speaking about Web, web th uh, 2.0. And uh, how ready are you to be transparent for this potential 50 trillion proxy market of the art? <laughs> I, let me Thank just you. clarify to make sure I, I know what you're ask, yeah. asking. So essentially what you're, what you're basically saying is, there's this new phase of technology that's opening that's based on cryptocurrencies and blockchain and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's fundamentally different in terms of its level of transparency, like at a DNA level, basically. Yeah, transparency and anonymity at the same time. It's mm -hmm. anonymous right. and transparent at the same time. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and how is that going exactly. to affect the art market going forward? Exactly, yeah. How, okay. how are you technically prepared to it, mm -hmm. if you are, are planning, mm -hmm. or, and, and how the other side <laughs> <laughs> ready to, right. to, to trade transparency mm -hmm. for 50 trillion potential uh, market. Because the most, the most uh, who will benefit after the, after the crash, the, the, the public will wash out, but the benefit the uh, Wall Street sharks and geeks, mm -hmm. definitely, from this new tech. Right, well, I mean, my answer to that personally would be that, I mean, we can have a really long conversation about sort of where the really kind of cutting edge of technology and art is going versus the more traditional aspects of the market that are only now integrating themselves with things like e-commerce and, and whatever else. Um, if you ask me for a sense of where I think it's going, I think that there's a, a real possibility that the kind of really tech avant-garde stuff that you're talking about, like crypto and blockchain and all that, that it ends up being, I think it all depends on how much that stuff ends up crossing over into the rest of the world. Like if everybody starts buying things with cryptocurrencies and the people who would normally buy art, like the Rubels or whoever, are, are using crypto to buy things, then I think there's a different outcome potentially for those, those kind of. Uh, uh, let's compare it to dot com boom, yeah? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm sort of. I was too young. Sorry. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to see it myself, I just can't right. read. Yeah, I mean, I to guess. To feel it myself. Yeah. I guess I, I, those just strike me as two different things. Like the dot com boom was, to my 
I mean, I was alive, but I wasn't really paying attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, same here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but but uh, uh, but did you had sales uh, during the dot com boom? I some, mean, what I what year? I can tell you from looking at the like the charts of sort of how the art market tracked, at least the auction market tracked with the stock market. Yeah, it's, there was definitely a crash after that. Like there was definitely a link between those two things, but then it, it rebounded. I, I think that it it more speaks to the idea of it's more about how wealth is interacting with art than necessarily how tech is interacting with art. So if a bunch of people end up getting very wealthy off of crypto and blockchain, um, then historically speaking, you would think that those people would start buying art. Now, I think that there's a question about whether or not getting rich in that space ends up kind of changing your entire perspective on things. Like, you, you think about the world differently than you would if you just like happened to invest in Amazon at the right time. Um, but that's a really, really complex conversation. Um, and I, yeah, I just don't, I, I think that the ultimately, like it's not a very satisfying answer, but I think that we still understand so little about the real traction that blockchain and crypto can have in the economy that it's really difficult to project from that to like a specific use case, like saying, oh, well, how is it going to affect the art market? That said, I am writing a series about this right now. So <laughs> check back in a couple of weeks, and I'll have some more details about it, if nothing else. Um, I don't know. Saskia, do you want to add anything to that? I think... Just Feel free to, to say no. Reiterate what you said. Okay. I don't, we won't... I don't think we know how it will impact the different industries. Yeah, yeah but uh, to, to make it simple, just like the... the, the the collide of transparency, yeah. The very wealth people who, as you said, mm -hmm. as you as you translated the question, yeah, have, have transparency in their DNA yeah. and the art market. How, how they will interact. I wouldn't want to be the one to predict okay. that. Because what, you, what you're speaking here is transparency. And imagine you have a huge amount of buyers mm -hmm. who really uh, respect Fair. transparency. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there are I think that there are levels of transparency though too. Like just getting people to be like, we're gonna be free and open about pricing is different than like jumping from that to to yeah, chain. like everything that ever happened with this piece is gonna be digital and there and you're gonna be able to track it through everything. And I don't know if people are ready for like getting people ready for one of those does mm -hmm. not necessarily mean that they're gonna be ready for the next. Mm -hmm. I, I mean again, we're we're sort of taking baby steps with all this stuff so far. So I don't know, man. It's <laughs> it's a wild space, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. I think we were talking about this morning at breakfast as well, um, blockchain, and whether or not um, we're thinking about this at our respective firms. And I think we both are. But it's more the idea of is the audience that we're dealing with ready for this type of technology, not whether or not we want to use it. Of course, it's it's fantastic. It's very interesting, and I think it might go in that direction. But I don't know such as online auctions in the early 2000s, you know, great idea, but at the time it wasn't, the audience wasn't ready for this and is not ready even to, to add prices to their artwork. So yes, we, you know, of course it's very interesting, but it has to be, I think, all about timing as well and, you know, the world to be ready for this type of level mm -hmm. of transparency. I think that's mostly also what it's about. My can, can I bring you a live scoop about blockchain and everything? While you were talking, I was reading the thing. Padelate has been merging, just announced to merge with Native, owned by Sergei skatos Reskov, who tried to buy Artnet and Art News and everything. And they will offer blockchain service. So this is the future. This is a, an amazing live news update. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just read it, so that's why. Well, <laughs> Padelate merge with uh, Native and doing blockchain. So we'll see. I, I agree That's with, a really with interesting I agree with yeah. Tim that it's much much too early to speak about it. It's and dot dot com boom uh, came from the fact that people extrapolated, you know, the world changing forever for everything. I mean, it took it took twenty years to get there, so it's too mm. much too early to get too excited. But, you know, uh, a few galleries still don't know how to use email, so let's not go too fast. Yeah. <laughs> and I think on the transparency point, you know, I feel like we're just getting started in terms of galleries being comfortable with sharing that data. Of the survey that uh, Tim referenced, the Artsy Gallery Roundup, I think it was 29% of galleries who responded say that they will publish their prices. So not quite a third yet. So I feel like we have um, a way to go until we will get to kind of this 
indelible online ledger that declares everything. I think we're gonna have to leave it there. <laughs> so thanks to everyone for your questions. I hope you enjoyed that.